Look, um, I want to kind of uh, want to jump in with, um, uh, I, I think, an assertion, that, and, and uh, I think it is proving to be more and more true as we go along, that the world is becoming more and more complex. Um, it's becoming more complex to the point where the decisions that we have to make inside of this world are becoming increasingly difficult, and even to the point where we as humans may not actually be able to make them sufficiently well inside of the world that we live in. However, that doesn't like, get us out of the responsibility of having to make the decisions. As, as individuals, as corporations, as governments, we've still got to make decisions to navigate a world that maybe we don't fully understand, and maybe that we can't fully understand because of the cognitive limitations of, of this brain. So this is a really interesting problem, and this is the problem that I've been working on for the last two and a half years with the company Primer. So we're now 35 engineers down in San Francisco. We just came out of stealth um, a couple of days ago. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting week going through all of this. But the challenge for us, as we've said it, is we want to build a system that can help accelerate our understanding of the world. And we think this is a really important problem. So we're doing this, and we're starting by this, um, by building machines that can read and write. Now, this is an important problem because a lot of the world's information is contained in, in text from diverse, different types of sources across different languages. And there's a huge amount of people, and we call them analysts, whose job it is to sit down and go through this information on a daily basis to try and figure out what happened in the world, to try and abstract some sense of meaning from it, and then to communicate that back to everyone that kind of goes up the chain. You can kind of think of analysts serving as the bottom layer of a very, very human neural network inside of the largest corporations and governments in the world. So this is work that's done by humans, but we're now at a place we can really start to automate this, and we can do it at a scale that goes beyond what humans can actually do. So we've currently got this deployed with some very big customers around the world. This is a selection of them. GIC, if you don't know GIC, that's the Singaporean Sovereign Wealth Fund. They literally own a fraction of a percent of everything. Uh, Walmart does about half a trillion dollars in revenue, so they literally have an index on almost everything. And NQTEL uh, serves as the broker between the, uh, the technology world and the, the world of government intelligence. And with the 17 different government intelligence agencies and 100,000 analysts working there, they live and breathe this stuff on a daily basis. So we've been working in this space very, very closely with these customers deploying this technology to help them which do one thing which they all share in common, is they're running up against the complexity of the world that they live in. They've gotten so big that they're running up against the world. So and it kind of, it's kind of underpinned by this equation, right? They've all done an amazing job of collecting data. In fact, they've spent a huge amount of money collecting data. Data has increased exponentially. The number of people that they have looking at that is at best linear. And what that does is it creates a delta between the information we should be looking at and the information we are looking at. And to put this in kind of a stark contrast, the, uh, the head of the National Geospatial Agency said if we were to actually have analysts looking at every bit of data that we could that we've collected, we need 8 million analysts. So this is a bit of a problem. This intelligence gap can actually you know, mean the difference, not just between dollars, but the difference between life and death. But it's something that we can close, not by throwing more people at this problem, but by automating the kinds of things that analysts do on a daily basis. So we need to look at what this might look like. If you're, say, an analyst covering uh, cryptocurrency, your um, day might look something like this. Here's a list of articles that you're looking at around cryptocurrency. You could substitute this for information coming out of Crimea or northern Iraq if you're in the intelligence space. Figure out what happened, what, if anything, is significant that's going on here. Kind of compress that down, see if you've seen this information before, perhaps. Figure out a story, um, contextualize that with everything that's gone before. Um, determine the significance of what you're seeing and compress it down to a one or two page briefing that you can push up through the, uh, the system. And it's kind of funny looking at this stuff and you see sort of how much stuff there actually is there. It it's almost doesn't feel like a human should be doing this because it's, it's actually an incredibly high volume of information. But we can actually um, produce this from Primer, a machine written output that takes that information and actually starts to describe it in a one-page briefing. And here it goes through and it starts to identify some events. I don't know if there's a key event that Russia is going to regulate Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, it's also pulled out a kind of bit of color around that, that when the statement from uh, Sergei, uh, one of the ministers there, made the statement that there was a flash crash that happened inside of that. 
Um, it then goes on to talk about some of the, the bubble and it identifies a couple of events inside of that. A man, of course, is selling everything he has to buy Bitcoin. Um, it goes down and talks about a, a topic around J.P. Morgan Chase and Ray Dalio. It probably should have said that that was Wall Street Insiders, but it, it did it right. It talked there around that, and I, I like the quote that it pulled out at the end uh, around Jamie Dimon being a significant person and uh, talking uh, about Bitcoin being a fraud, saying if you were in Venezuela or Ecuador or North Korea or a bunch of parts like that, or if you were a, a, a drug dealer or a murderer, stuff like that, you'd be better off doing it in Bitcoin than US dollars, which I think is sort of the ultimate shade thrown by Wall Street insiders to a cryptocurrency. <laughs> So look, you've, you've got an overview here. You can kind of customize this um, depending on how much you know, depending on how deep you want to go. If you want a regional focus on China, it can write that for you as well. You can dive into this and look here and say, look, here's a deep dive into this Russian regulation. Looking at the summary, it's pulled out a map and generated that for you and said Moscow and Sochi are both important. And it's highlighted the fact that Moscow and Sochi are the two places at conferences where key people from the Russian uh, government have made statements about the, uh, the regulation of Bitcoin. So you're starting to get to a place where this is not just done for cryptocurrencies, but it can be done for anything. And it can be done all the time. You're getting a self-updating, self-continually generated map of the world communicated in human language. This is powerful stuff. It's driven, um, and it's a difficult technical problem that's driven by um, a bunch of core analytic engines. And I want to run you through a few of those as we go. So the structure engine allows us to take the documents and actually look for structure at the kind of the base level. So you can take a statement like this, determine the number, determine the units, and determine also if it's been modified. You can put them together into the events engine to identify real-world events and all the evidence pertaining to those as they unfold in the world. In this case, um, an event around Apple building a, uh, a self-driving uh, electric car. So with that, um, it can go into the ensemble engine, and it, what it actually does is it takes all of the evidence pertaining to that and starts to say, well, you know, we can go through all of this, and these all seem to be saying the same thing. There's about 600 people working on this. This is the, um, is, the, is the mean approximation or the best kind of representation of what it thinks there is, in this case, 600 people working. It can also find consensus. So, you know, it's going to say, look, 2019 is the date that they say they're going to launch this. But equally well, and if you're an analyst, it can find contradiction. They're saying there's no way they're going to hit this. Um, and actually kind of putting both of those side by side are very, very important you know, for analysts as they think about bias. It can also chase the long tail. If there's 100 different documents, or a couple of hundred, knowing that in document 161 in paragraph 3 that there's a key bit of information about the battery technology that they have, this may make you as an analyst think a little bit differently about the likelihood of this unfolding. You also want to put this in context. So you need to understand what's sort of come before to understand what's happening today. So we can take in a, an event here. In this case, Tesla's Model S is getting a software version update, which enhances semi-autonomous driving capabilities. Uh, a week later, you get um, it tending to drift off highways. Um, then Tesla says, we want to stop people uh, being killing themselves. That's probably a good thing. Um, but then a couple of months later, uh, GM delays its super cruise technology. Now, if you just read GM delaying a super cruise technology and don't know that the things have unfolded beforehand, you're going to treat that maybe a little bit differently. Context is really important, and it's something that we as human analysts do pretty well. But you want to be able to automate that and bring that back into the system. Difference engine is, um, I think, a really interesting one. It starts to kind of highlight differences um, between different uh, representations of the world. In this case, we can take um, a set of Russian documents about self-driving cars, and we can look at that and identify a set of events. Um, you can run a translation layer on that, and you can see all the events that it's found, which is interesting. This is Russia telling the story of self-driving cars. And you can do a diff on that and determine the ones that are only in Russian and don't have a corollary in English. Now, this is interesting, you know, and particularly the one there talking about China's um, engagement and that the relationship between Russia and China that they have in Russian language and not in English is, um, is very fascinating. So with all of that, you um, then want to put that up into a story engine. And the story engine ultimately collects all of this together and starts to tell you a story. So you can generate an intelligence briefing, in this case looking at Russian documents pertaining to Syria, and you can kind of zoom in and see there's some pretty subtle, pretty interesting things inside of that. So the, the topic here, FSB in court cases, it was not present in Western media and included the events that the migrants were maintained, uh, de detained, for conspiring to aid ISIS. 
This is some of Russia's issues that it has down in the Caucasus. We don't see this because it's in Russian only, but you can generate this report on, all the time and it becomes the first draft for the intelligence analyst to start looking at. You can also generate this one. This is a, uh, a profile of Janet Kelso. She's a scientist. Um, she doesn't have a Wikipedia page, but this might be a nice one. Probably should have one. Um, the uh, automated insights uh, for consumers. So this is uh, if you're wondering about what's driving uh, frozen dinner purchasing, as, um, as perhaps some people at Walmart might be. Um, you can see potentially it's driven by uh, millennials. They're responsible for everything, including frozen dinners. <laughs> Um, but you can also do things a little more interactive. So you can automatically generate um, a map. In this case, it's looking at Russian and English documents pertaining to terrorism. There's 40 million documents that were considered. It generated um, what you're going to look at in front of now. And so it's looking for terrorism events around the world, looking at them in Russian and English. As so you can see, you know, it's also generating the breakpoints in the story. So here you're seeing um, the first breakpoint it finds is, uh, is in Beslan. And for those that don't remember Beslan, it was 2004. It's sort of Russia's 9-11. And um, you can see on that day there, in, on, on the 3rd of September, there was also um, some focus down in the Philippines, where there was, a, uh, there was a bombing that killed at least 14 people. You can see uh, the next day it jumps through as it picks up September 11th. You can see where the focuses are there. And then you go through a week after that, and you see the first major attack that it picks up, um, in this case, the, uh, the pipe bombs uh, in Chelsea. Um, Interesting, that's where the, uh, the, the focus was. You can see the red and the blue, the blue indicating English coverage and the red indicating Russian coverage. But you can also see Bishkek. I don't think anyone knows what happened in Bishkek, and if you don't read Russian, there's no way you would have known it didn't make a translation into English. But there was a suicide bomb at the Chinese embassy, and while we were focusing attention there, of course that was important for Russia. So you start to see as this thing evolves, different views of the world as it unfolds. And the events come and the attention and where we choose to put the attention starts to unfold. You can see here, this is interesting, is the northern part of India. And you can see um, there was actually a conference there where the Prime Minister of Afghanistan was alleging that the, uh, the, Pakistani, were, uh, the Pakistani military was um, actually sheltering uh, terrorism uh, inside of its borders. What's fascinating there is the Russians don't seem to care about that at all. There's no attention given to, to India really at all. Um, you also see as this evolves, we, we do very little when it comes to Africa and South America in either language. So these events start unfolding. You can see here um, Istanbul nightclub bombing, massive Russian coverage, 39 people died. You can see a similar attack, 36 people died in Baghdad, but much less coverage that unfolded there. So, of course, attention is not given evenly across these spaces. This one it was surprising for me. This is a Hague. This is a court case running. Um, between uh, Russia and the Ukraine, where the Ukraine is taking Russia to the Hague and saying, um, you know, you, you're committing war crimes in Crimea. You can keep jumping forward through this. It'll pick out um, this Manchester bombing, very significant um, attack. But also on the same day, you've got the U.S. president down in Ryder making a statement that the Muslim community is not doing enough to stop terrorism. Meanwhile, in Krasnyarsk, um, you've got the uh, deputy Russian minister for terrorism saying, hey, Russia is not so bad here. We're actually 10 times down where we used to be. Maybe. <laughs> where you end up on this, at the end, is ultimately a map that's shown of all the major attention that's given around the world in Russian and English. The kind of perspective that we have. Now, this comes back to the fundamental issue that we have as humans. We have a finite amount of information that we can process. If you read English, this is the kind of the, the view of the world that you're going to get. If you're Russian, you'll get that view. They overlap in some places you can see in purple, Tehran uh, being one of those, um, where the, kind of the worlds intersect. But what's fascinating about this is the degree to which these worldviews kind of differ. We can measure this. We can not only measure it, we can identify the events within it, we can determine the significance of those, and we can map that out with breakpoints in a story so that you've got a place where you as an analyst can start with this and start to think about, well, what, for example, is that little red dot doing in the middle of America? That little red dot is um, Arkansas, Little Rock. You're like, why is there a terrorism event that was only covered by Russians in Arkansas? And we thought it was a mistake, right? We thought this is a mistake because we would have heard about this. 
turned out that there was about 11 people killed in a nightclub. And the Russians reported this um, in a tweet from the consulate, that it was a terrorist attack and Russians might be involved. Now, three days later, they rescinded that, and they said, look, no, we, we maybe we got that wrong. We, of course, reported this as um, a, a killing between two uh, rappers that wasn't terrorism-related at all. But it's a question of how much of that attention kind of gave a mindset that there might have been something there. And we told one story, they told another. And that, that sort of attention is focused in, in a different view of the world from the people that were looking at it. So, look, there's a lot that we can do with this stuff. We're just getting started, and um, I'm excited to see what comes next. Thank you.